Hello, I'm Brack, the esoteric jellyfish. Welcome to the ocean. This video is about the Christian corruption of the Septuagint. Before we begin, I want to make a clarification that has caused some confusion at times. So what do we mean by the word Septuagint? Instead of reinventing the will, I will quote Emmanuel Tove from his book, The Text Critical Use of the Septuagint in Biblical Research, in which he says, the name Septuaginta, which now refers to all Jewish Greek biblical books, at first applied only to the Torah. When the collection of Greek biblical books grew however, it came to denote the whole corpus. This is how I will be using the term throughout this video. Now back to the topic at hand, which is the Christian corruption of the Septuagint. To demonstrate this phenomenon, we'll be focusing on the Septuagint's version of Psalm 14, in which verse 3 is a lot longer than the Hebrew text would dictate, showing how it was modified to match the text in Romans 3. Before beginning, I will go over the color scheme used to compare the text we will be looking at, as well as a short discussion on the different chapter and verse numbering systems used in Psalms. After this, the first thing we will do is briefly go over the Hebrew text of Psalm 14 and its twin Psalm 53, basically to establish a baseline, as well as a quick look at the difference between the Greek versions of verse 3 in these two Psalms. Next, we will see how the text in Romans 3, 10 to 18 is actually a tapestry of various Old Testament passages glued together. Then we will see how this tapestry was used to replace the third verse of Psalm 14 in order for it to conform with the New Testament text, with the textual variants clearly demonstrating this. And lastly, we'll talk about what repercussions and effects this has on some of the various fallacious assertions that are made about the Septuagint. I will be using the following color scheme to help with analyzing the text for a comparison. Black for when the texts have identical words, red for when one text has a word that the other doesn't, green for when different forms of the same word is used, dark blue for when different words are used that have the same basic meaning, light blue for when different words are used that have different meanings, and light and dark purple for when the texts have identical words, but in a different word order. This will help to quickly and effectively illustrate the variations. I want to point out the variations in the English, Hebrew, and Greek numbering systems for the verses and chapters in Psalms, in order to avoid any possible confusion. In the English numbering system, normally the header and the first line are counted as one verse. But in the Hebrew numbering system, they are separately numbered, causing an offset where subsequent verses in the Hebrew system will be one higher than that of the English system, with a few psalms having an offset of two. Also, what is labeled as Psalms 9 and 10 in the English and Hebrew systems are combined and labeled in the Greek system as Psalm 9, causing an offset where subsequent chapters in the Greek system will be one lower than that of the English and Hebrew systems. So, for example, Psalm 14 in the English and Hebrew systems is Psalm 13 in the Greek system. For the sake of simplicity, even though I personally prefer the Hebrew system, I will be using the English system in this video. Now the preliminaries are done, let's dive into this. Looking at the text, conveniently color-coded, we can plainly see that Psalm 14 and 53 are almost identical, indicated by all the black text. One of the main differences is that Psalm 14 uses the Tetragrammaton in many places where Psalm 53 uses Elohim. And of course, there are some other variations indicated by the various colors, but by and large, they are similar. Now I want to go back to the previous slide and take a close look at verse 3 of both Psalms. Except for two words, one of which is just a grammatical variant, the lines are the same. But when looking at the Septuagint, the verse in Psalm 14 is severely a lot longer than its Psalm 53 counterpart, indicated by all the red text. So let's get to the bottom of this. It has been a long-standing practice in Jewish literature from the Second Temple period up into the present to weave verses or parts of verses from a multitude of various passages into a new text especially in liturgical settings. Here is an example from the beginning rubric of the Havdalah prayer recited at the end of Sabbath, 
which is made up of several different passages. I dubbed this phenomenon versal mergers in my dissertation, in which this was a significant component. This topic within itself needs its own video, which I hope to do in the future, at which time I will add a link to it in this current video's description. The reason I mention all of this is due to the text in Romans 3, 10 to 18 falling squarely into this category, which we will now examine. Verse 10 starts off by saying, as it is written, to indicate he will be quoting text from scripture. What follows is identical to Ecclesiastes 7.20, except each has a word or two the other doesn't, and has a grammatical variation of a word. Verses 11 to 12 are almost identical to the second half of Psalm 53, 2 and 3. The main differences being each has some words the other doesn't, Romans also has the word that, where the psalm has or, and they use a different Greek word for good as well. These variations and the others that will follow will be important later. Verse 13 is identical to the second half of Psalm 5, 9, and the second half of Psalm 40, verse 3. Verse 14 is identical to Psalm 10, 7, except that the words are in a different order, and the psalm has an extra word, which is just a redemptive pronoun. Verse 15 kind of cherry picks a few words from the first half of Isaiah 59 7. Verses 16 and 17 are identical to the second half of Isaiah 59 7 and the first half of verse 8, except each passage uses a different Greek word for know or known. Verse 18 is identical to the second half of Psalm 36 1 except Romans has their and the psalm has his. So it's very clear that this passage in Romans was created by doing a versal merger of these various Old Testament passages. Now let's compare the text from Romans 3, 12 to 18 with the Septuagint's version of Psalm 14, 3. As you can tell by the color-coded text being in all black, they are identical. Not one single variation whatsoever, making it extremely clear that the Christian copier of this verse conformed it to match perfectly with the text in Romans. Now, to put the nail in the coffin, let's look at the few places where the text in Romans diverges from what is in the Septuagintal sources, which were weaved together with the Septuagint's text of Psalm 14.3. Verse 12 of Romans 3 has one word different from Psalm 53, 3. Psalm 14, 3 has this very same variant matching Romans. Verse 14 has one word different, missing one word, and has a different word order from Psalm 10, verse 7. Psalm 14, 3 has all these very same variants matching Romans. Verse 17 has one word different from Isaiah 59, 8. Psalm 14, 3 has this very same variant matching Romans. And verse 18 has one word different from the second half of Psalm 36, 1. Psalm 14, 3 has this very same variant matching Romans. So from all this, we can plainly see that Psalm 14, 3 was a victim of the Christian corruption of the Septuagint. To probably address how the significance of this affects various fallacious assertions about the Septuagint, I will need to do a separate video in the future, at which time I will add a link to it in this current video's description. But I do want to at least briefly discuss some key points at this time. There are very few pre-Christian manuscripts of the Septuagint. We only have scarce fragments of the Torah and Minor Prophets from Qumran and some additional texts of Genesis and Deuteronomy and Papyrus Ra 266 from the Cairo Geniza that date from the 2nd century BCE to the 1st century CE. We also have some fragments of Psalms and Job from Oxyrhynchus that date from the 1st to 2nd century CE, but they may or may not be of Christian origin. Allow me to quickly give you an idea of what is meant by fragments of. Here's what we have of Exodus. Just one small piece of papyrus with seven incomplete lines, only covering verses 4 to 7 of chapter 28. This is all we have of the Greek book of Exodus. And here's what we have of Numbers. 
much better than Exodus, as this time we have 19 fragments covering chapter 3, verse 39, to chapter 4, verse 16. And this is all that we have of the Greek book of Numbers. Again, in the future video I hope to do, I will go into more detail about these manuscripts. So what we have is not the Jewish version of the Septuagint, but instead the Christian version. With Christian copyists changing the Septuagint to have it line up with the New Testament, we have the situation that the New Testament isn't quoting the Septuagint, but rather the Septuagint is modified to quote the New Testament. The assertion that some people make that it represents some ancient Jewish understanding of the text in the Bible is fallacious, such as the claims some try to make in regards to Isaiah's A Virgin Shall Conceive, where the Hebrew has young woman, also trying to use it as proof of some Jewish conspiracy to cover up Jesus of Nazareth being the Messiah is plain ridiculous. And again, in the future video I hope to do, I will go into more detail about these issues. Thank you so much for watching. Please like, subscribe, and share. Additional information and or links, if any, will be in the description below. Until next time, don't be afraid to take a dive. The water's fine.